Welcome everyone to episode three of Bloody Elbow Cross Promotion with me, Zane Simon. I'm joined this time, I'd like to say this week, but this isn't a weekly show. This is like the third one I've done in six months. I try, I try to plan them around UFC uh, scheduling breaks, like when there's not an event, non, non-event weeks. But the truth is we've got like one of those until the end of the year and I'm going to be traveling. So th- I, I just had to pull this one together and make it happen because I'm joined today by Julie Kedzie, somebody I've wanted to t- talk to for quite a while now one of the uh, most vibrant and, you know, best faces around the sport, somebody who's been on both sides of it, both in the media now and in the ring before. And so, Julie, thank you so much for joining me on this. Thank you for having me. I think the problem's going to be getting me to shut up. No, I, that's, that's, <laughs> that's great. I, I, am, I, I, do, I want people who don't shut up because yeah. if, if you don't talk, then it's just me talking and there's enough shows <laughs> where it's just me talking. That's, that's neither a new concept nor something I should really be trying to resell. Yeah, I just realized there's like boobs in frame. That's kind of awesome. Yeah, oh. see. there's some boobs. Oh, yeah, that's... Well, they're they're artistic. That'll groups. sell, right? That, that yeah, sells. you'll get ad spots for that. A good hard sell for the show. You know, <laughs> we we it will include. I should I should have put that in the explainer. Julie Kedzie will be showing a pair of boobs. <laughs> <laughs> I totally just noticed that. I was so worried of my hair and makeup situation or lack thereof. All right. I have a cat right here. That's why I keep looking down. Sorry, she's. That's all right. That's all right. My dog's lingering somewhere off camera, but I'm trying to play with my camera anyway. I'm here to talk. I want to talk just kind of about the art of matchmaking because I I do a a, a column every time there's a UFC card. It's one of those like jokey uh, fights to make columns that is just like, hey, here's the fights I'd like to see after this latest card. Everybody talk about it because I know it probably won't happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's gotten me over time. It's just like, well, how the shit does this actually work? Because it's all kind of surround, you know, from the MMA fan perspective, I'm just like, you know, I want to see Conor McGregor fight a bear and Khabib Nurmagomedov at the same time, Master Blaster style, like uh, in Thunderdome. And that's the, f- why can't the UFC book it? And you know, as somebody who's actually been on the other side of it, I figured you'd be the best person to give me some small insight into the <laughs> world. Well, I mean, I I don't know. I obviously in matchmaking, I've never dealt with the volume that, yeah. that Joe Silva and Sean Shelby have had. So, um, and really, I was so very fortunate because when I uh, when Invicta hired me a few years ago. I saw Joe Silva and he just took me under his wing. I saw him at a show and he just told me everything that he does, not day by day stuff, but he said, I can come shadow him anytime. Um, I can, I mean, he worked from Virginia, so that was fun. I didn't go there. I don't have any money, but that's not the matchmaking part. I'm just a very poor member. Um, and he, um, he just really was helpful. He showed me some apps I could get on my phone to help me keep organized. Uh, Melissa Hendricks, who was with the UFC at that time too, just completely helped me with just the organizational organizational protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I work with Shannon Knapp, who is absolutely the most kind hearted person that could ever live. And I mean, anybody would have fired me when I first came on board for the stupid shit I did. So, you know, she's, she's amazing. And it wasn't like the actual matchmaking, making of the matches. That's not what it's about. It's about paperwork, contracts, keeping track of what you say to one person and understanding that what you say to somebody, they will either take as a hint and suggestion or they will take it as the God's honest truth. So, you know, you just have to, it's, I think a lot of matchmaking is actually, I don't want to say PR, but I, I, a lot of it's just learning how to communicate with people and establishing really good relationships. And Shannon has been a huge example for me. And I mean, she's a fantastic matchmaker, even though it's her company, she, you know, but she's, she like, I, yeah, I feel like that woman should have stepped, <laughs> should run the world. You know, like, I'm just like, <laughs> for Tina's like, you know, everything like that. Like she should be on that multi-billion dollar, sorry, there's cat fur in the air. No, it, on the multi-billion dollar level of like, because she's so talented. She's so good at, at what she's doing. So it, it's, it's more of like a, then, I mean, so like the way you're describing it, it's more the focus on, I guess you could say like PR 
for for the promotion to fighters saying like this uh, is this is what we should be able to deliver for you and when and how I, you know vaguely like i i'm honored under um a uh, non-disclosure agreement so i can't really say anything specific but i, I a lot of it's I, I would say it's just establishing strong lines of communication that don't end up being strong like every line of communication can be tenuous over one word or one thing hi poppers one thing that um one person thinks they're being promised and and if something gets lost you know in a step along the way you end up eating shit for it even if it's not you and i'm not saying that happened to me i'm not saying you know i'm just saying it's just you have to take the responsibility of all the mistakes and that's that's a huge part of matchmaking yeah i mean it, it does like because i think for me a lot of fans at least too we we sort of assume it's like I like the idea. So that, you know, I like the idea that there's this. There are apps out there, and I'm assuming it's not just like World of Mixed Martial Arts. Like, no, I mean, I'm talking about like organizational like folder maps. Yeah, I, I love it. How to scan things with it. So, they, yeah. they should make a a matchmaking app for you know. I'm sure there's one out there. Probably American Top Team has something like that. They have everything. They're so like on the ball with that kind of thing. They're so technical. Yeah. But uh, so like. You know, I, I, I part of this too is then how much of matchmaking too comes down to scouting. Like, how much of it was you know? Do you have to do with bringing people in and looking at and saying like, I'm gonna go and find somebody for this fight. Do people come to you, or is it does the promotion bring people to you? When I came on they? board, there was quite a strong roster. Despite we had to rebuild our entire strawweight yep. division and bantamweight division, and both of those, I think have I think they're really coming along. And I would say. When it comes to scouting, it's fun as hell. Like, that's the fun part. Uh -huh. And I mean, I have all of these people. I want this person to fight this person, that person to fight that person. But this, you run into the craziest shit. Like, you apply for a visa with plenty of advance, and then it just doesn't come through. And you're left with fighters being put off of cards or fighters thinking that you're not delivering for them when, in fact, it was their country. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was, again, so you're just like, it, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff where you just have to, you want to see certain fights very, very badly, but financially maybe that can't work on the card for whatever reason, or this fighter's injured, or this fighter keeps saying they want to fight all the time, but then when it comes up to fight, something comes up and then they can't fight. And then they're like left on the wayside and you've already established the next couple of fights for that division on. So you inserting them back into the mix, it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's a puzzle. And I, I will say Caitlin Young on board with um, Invicta now, she's, um, she's stepping into basically chief matchmaker position. Although I, I don't know that I should say that. I mean, I, I, it's, yeah, we're, there's a shift happening there, but she's amazing at that. Like uh, of scouting, of keeping track of things and just, just so, she's so analytical and she's so good at it. Like I can't say enough good stuff about it. Like she's going to really bring, I think she's going to bring the company to a whole new level. Is there any one country then? Like I, the thing that comes up to me is, is there any one country that's hardest to get fighters out of? Like I, you know, Brazil was tough this past year, but a lot of that was the Olympics too. Uh, like it, it should have been like, I guess for some companies or for some uh, agencies and stuff, embassy type things, it was really easy because the Olympics and for others, like there was just poor luck. Yeah, so, and it's just the most embarrassing thing in the world to say due to visa issues because you want to be like, you just want to see the fight, man. Like I'm, yeah. I'm still a fan at heart. I just love watching good fights, and when you can't put them, you when you can't put them on, you feel so bad for the fighter. You feel so bad for their opponent. You feel so bad for the fans. Like it's just not. It's it's you know it's difficult, and you also have to be on the ball. You have to get like cut your emotions out and be like, okay, who's next? Who do I put next? Who do I do here? And so it's, you know, I would say that's what matchmaking, a lot of it's about building relationships with people. Um, a lot of it's, I'm sorry, my dog has a squeaky toy now. <laughs> a lot of it, you know, you have to eat a lot of shit and you have to spend a lot of nights going through paperwork. Um, but the highs are really high. Like yeah. When that fight happens and it's just gorgeous it feels really good to see, to see that come up bar and know that you had, you're not the fighter. You don't get to take responsibility for what they're doing out there, but you get to say, wow, you know, in a small way, I was a part of helping put this together. And that's really nice. 
So there's a couple of points too then that that makes me think about is one of the things that I've noticed and I feel I don't know if this is I you know th- I don't know if this is true because a lot of this what I'm doing here is me trying to figure out what's true and what's shit that I, just goes on in my head and I'm sitting on the sidelines going ah oh, yeah that's how that works see but um one of the things that seems like has kind of happened is that especially with women's MMA it feels like it has kind of it has a bottom and it has a top and there's not really a middle where you have like because the, the evolution of MMA ended up or women's MMA it feels like to me ended up being a very top down system where you got sort of you ended up with stars who then brought people in, in brought people to invest in creating a bottom of the sport brought got pr- other promotions saying oh hey Gina Carano is a really big deal maybe we should actually put on some women's MMA fights. You know, like, it it feels like these things, like, it wasn't like this long, it didn't feel like a long, careful build up from the bottom up where you had this slow progression of of talent collecting until you got these really strong divisions and then these stars at the top. It felt like we kind of got some stars and then everybody else had, everything else had to kind of come in to fill behind them. I would actually put that completely in opposite to what you yeah. said. <laughs> well, okay, so here's the deal. Gina Carano is somebody who was born to be a star. Even if she was a kindergarten teacher, that woman would be a star somehow because of her charisma and, and what she what she gives off. Ronda Rousey was an Olympic athlete before she was an MMA fighter. She had that that charismatic, again, a quality about her that y- your eyes go to them. And not because necessarily the way they look, they're both beautiful women, but because of the way, uh, I guess, the presence that they have when they're in a room. When they're in a room, you know they're in a room. Um, Same thing with Holly Holm. Uh Um, Same thing with, I I would argue Michelle Waterson, but, you know, again, we're also very good friends, so of course I would talk to her first time in a room. But (laughs) um, but, so there's, there's certain people, it's not just their athletic ability or their looks. There's certain people who have that, thing that it factor and i don't know how to explain the it factor because it's been thrown around as such a like it sounds insulting sometimes but it's it's not insulting i saw bob dylan in concert once and i what he this was in well not the 90s but the early 2000s i think it might have been the 90s that's embarrassing but i saw him in concert once and he's up on stage and he's this old skinny ass looking scarecrow man <laughs> and his voice had seen better days as well and when we're talking about bob dylan i mean that was a very distinctive voice <laughs> But that man would deliver a song and he would just cock his head to the side and put his hand on his hip. And I swear to God, he could have been Joe Schmo from the street. You were drawn to him. It was like one of those moments where you're like, I understand how world leaders are followed. Because some people have a presence about them where they're just meant to be not looked at so much as, but almost followed. Almost. Yeah. So I, up there. And I, I think that, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was gonna say so. Maybe what I mean, what I'm saying then is that it feels like maybe the stars that we've gotten in women women's MMA have kind of catapulted ahead of the growth of the sport. Where like you have the beginnings in these early parts, you know, you have a lot of talent coming up and rising, and then you have these huge stars who are capable of, you know, being massive, like Ronda Rousey being just massive pay per view headlining stars, and we don't have as much of the like, and, and this is going to sound terrible. So you're going to have to excuse me ahead of time of the chaff. Like we don't have as many of the, the fighters who make up, you know, like the, the 10 and five records and the, you know, 20 and four and are good and fill up cards and make a well, lot of. Yeah. When did you first start watching women's MMA? Like what, what fight brought you to see it? Like, was it like the old Becky, Becky Levi or, or was it the, like what? It was probably, it was the, it was the, when Strike Force started. Bringing Strike Force. It. Yeah. Because that was a huge stage. Yeah. People like Marlus Conan were winning tournaments yeah. and on a high stage, but people didn't know who they were. And that was in 2001 and before. Yeah. I think that, the problem isn't so much that there's a middle division missing or, or that these promotions saw Gina Carano, they saw the money that could be made off of, you know, people who were natural born stars. I think that the opportunities just 
were so, people just didn't have their eyes open. And I don't want to scream sexism, 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 but fuck it is. Well, yeah. People just didn't think women could fight. And we have these, you know, Svetlana Gord, oh, I can't even say her name anymore. But I mean, you know, Megumi yeah. Abishita, Megumi Fuji. We have these people who, who were fighting and fighting and busting their asses, but not getting any recognition for it, except for a very, very niche circles or niche, yeah. I don't know, whatever that word is. Um, and that's, um, I'm so glad that the big stage came along. I'm so uh-huh. glad. Because I think that what we consider mid-level fighters or what we, you know, we was the 10 and five fighters, the undercard fighters and everything like that. Um, they could have been stars uh-huh. and they just didn't get the exposure or the platform or they didn't like, I, I was really fortunate in my career because I, I mean, yeah, I was on the losing end of my famous fights, but I had, I had the opportunity to take the stage. Um, so many people when they just, I, I don't think they appreciate what people like Shayna Baszler has done for the sport. And yeah, she has a attitude that turns people off and stuff, but I mean, she was out there fighting in barns and all that other shit and, you know, back road shows. And just because she loved it, Tara LaRosa too, just uh-huh. because they loved it. And those fighters today are the new crop of fans come in and they're just like, ah, rah, rah. you know, they're, they're, yeah. shit. they're, you know, it's just like they're past their prime. It's just like they never had a chance to have a prime. Yeah. And that, that's it's definitely, like, yeah. I, I don't want to say these people never existed or like, Oh, there aren't any, you know, good mid-level women fighters out there. I guess, I guess part of it maybe is like that they've, aged out or that they've you know they've fallen out of the sport now and we now have like this really like a big crop of exciting new fighters and a rising crop of star headliners and then we're promotions are still working on like well you know how do we create veteran fight fighters mm-hmm. and, and i think that the issue with that is in the time period where women started to get very popular uh, uh again i'm going to bring up the male gaze um yeah. they're they, I think a lot of the women who were at a position to be primed were kind of looked over for everybody wanting the sexy model. And it goes, it just seemed to be who's going to be the next Gina Carano? Who's it? There's nobody who's going to be the next Gina. Gina Carano is Gina Carano. Everybody as a fighter is going to be, nobody said who's going to be the next Randy Couture. You know, everybody as a fighter is going to exist in their own sphere and they're going to bring what they can to the table. Now, for some people, they have, you know, like Gina and Rhonda and, and, and Holly, they have these a presence they're they're extremely beautiful which people like to look at beautiful people i get that but people like to it, it, it's it doesn't mean that the other girls weren't beautiful in their performances or weren't talented in their performance it just wasn't the the gaze wasn't on them uh-huh. and the people who i mean assholes like gary shaw coming along and just oh i'm gonna make you the only person that's important in this it was just like it, it became an attitude that was accepted and I don't know, you know, at the end of the day, well, look where we are now. Women are in the UFC. So I don't know, maybe that was the path that had to be taken. But I know for a fact that somebody like Gina would never have wanted anybody to be left behind and for her to be, you know, I talk about her a lot. I mean, she, she's just a fucking incredibly lovely human being. But also just, she would never have wanted people to be left behind. Um, and when... And also being in that male gaze, being the one who's up there as she was, as, as Rhonda is, yeah, you have to take so much shit. Those girls have to take so much shit. If they're in a beautiful, sexy picture, I mean, people like me back in the day was just like, ah, that's slutty. And no, that's not slutty. That's somebody celebrating their body and being wonderful. But I was raised with really ignorant attitudes in certain aspects of my life. And it took me a long time to grow into honestly accepting women as women and that's me i'm saying this right now i'm a sexist as shit um because i was trained in the male gaze and i i think that the amount of crap that those women have to take that they take on top of themselves in order to be at a level where they're the star and the amazing fighter it's it's incredible i most men would wilt under that absolutely wilt under that most women would wilt under that but for some reason, these very charismatic women who were very beautiful at a certain time came along and instead of hogging the spotlight, or not hogging the spotlight, but instead of making it all about them, they opened it up for everyone else. And that's what makes it, uh, maybe the light didn't shine on the mid-level fighters or the fighters who didn't get to make it, but their contributions were so important. Like 
I get furious when I hear the way people talk about Sarah Kaufman. They don't remember that she was a multi-time world champion. They don't remember people couldn't touch her in the game. Women avoided fighting her because they were scared of her because she hit like a fucking truck. And, sorry for my language. <laughs> like, I don't know. God I just, you know, just, it kills me when people disrespect like Tara La Rosa or, or, or Shayna Baszler. But they've been kind of trained to see people a certain way. And um, it, it kills me when people disrespect Ronda Rousey. She, she's maybe said things that I've disagreed with, but why would you want to agree with somebody all the time? Why not listen to what people have to say, try to incorporate their perspectives into your view in the world. If it makes you stronger in your own views, great. But she is a beautiful human being, absolutely beautiful human being, who gives all the time to charity. She brought everyone else up with her. I mean, she didn't, Dana may have said it was the Ronda show, but she had to have a division to fight and she she brought the rest of us up in a way. So I don't know, I like her. <laughs> but so, like part of that too then, um, you know, do you feel like, in, cause to me then I, I look at Invicta and where they are now, and, you know, obviously they've gone through a couple of cycles of, well, especially one big cycle of getting cleaned out by the UFC for this strawweight division. And there's, you know, it, it feels like there's, like the importance of Invicta to, to somebody like me is to, is the same thing as the importance of somebody like Tara La Rosa or Shayna Baszler, where it's like, you have to have, people competing like the only way the sport thrives is to have people competing and to have a stage in which they regularly compete and which in which fighters are made like you can't make fighters starting you know and not to talk poorly of her or anything but you can't you, not everyone can be Paige Van Zandt like you can't just grab somebody at 2-0 and or 1-0 and and say okay you're going to be the next star go thrive in the spotlight and that's how we're going to find all our fighters. Like the UFC has run through a, ha a whole handful of really decent women fighters because they brought them in at two and O three and O and then put them in really hard fights. And then they're now, you know, they're back thriving in Invicta. Somebody like Angela Hill is Angela thriving Hill. in Invicta. I, I want Angela Hill to be with Invicta forever selfishly, but Angela Hill should be back in the UFC. Yeah. She and I, yeah, I, yeah, she's amazing. But, but Invicta has to exist for somebody like her to get there. Like it just it does. And Invicta's also, I think I should point out, we're not a feeder league. No, yeah. Like even though the UFC does come in, we work with the UFC because they've been great. First of all, they they've really they've really helped, and I think they understand um, the importance of having, like you're saying, of having a group like us around. The thing that, that Evicta, what Shannon created in Evicta, when she saw how poorly the girls without the spotlight were being treated, but who were amazing fighters, and and she was, you know, and that's why she gave them a platform because she believed in something a little bit deeper, and the payout is there. Women are in the UFC now, and it's not because of Strike Force; it's because of Shannon. Now, mm -hmm. I really truly believe that it's because Shannon created that that platform for visibility and for uh, I don't know. Well, it's just, like, just it's regularity to me. It's the ability yeah. to have some place where you know that you know. I I look at places like Bellator and World Series of Fighting that have dabbled in women's MMA, and it's they'll put on one fight every four months with a couple of fighters and that you never then you may never see again and it's just like you can't you can't establish and and i see i feel like that's a lot of the attitude around around the globe with women's mma is it's like oh we put on one fight on this card it's a showcase thing isn't this person awesome and then they're never going to fight there again it's like if you're not if you're not building events that people can rely on at month every month every two months then they can't establish a career. They can't create a career. And, you know, what's fun about that trying to build stars uh, attitude from certain promotions that you've named is it always bites them in the ass. You cannot build a division around one person. You have to have a division in, in order to succeed. And you can't... Uh, the whole... I understand. I understand. I always hear, MMA is a show. It's entertainment. It's not a sport. Well, it's a sport to the people fucking training. And it's yeah. a sport to the women who are grinding every day in the gym, pushing themselves incredibly hard. And you may not call it sport, actually, it's passion. It's something that's deeper. And when these, I think when these promotions 
have that one female fight that they try to showcase on it. And yeah, I'm being ungrateful because I was that one female fight and show in well, elite XC before. Like I, 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 I mean, I was on the poor end of it both times, but I was that one female fight. But the thing is I'll fucking, I, I'll look that gift horse in the mouth because I'll be like, when you take the time to establish a full division, then you're allowing, you're allowing a seed to be planted because it was no problem filling up the straw weight division in Invicta after um, the UFC bought them out. And I, I saw, I have, I have very many reporter friends <laughs> and stuff like that. I, I follow what, what they were saying about, oh, it's not going to be the same. It's not the same. It's different. It's like, well, guess what? Nothing's the same. Bellator is not the same as it used to be. The UFC is not the same as it used to be. Everything evolves. Everything grows. And you either grow with it and understand what's happening and learn to analyze a new fighter, whether or not you know their last name, and analyze them by their technique, or you stop pretending you know MMA because it's never going to stay the same. It's not, I don't know how to explain it. It's an art. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, and it has to change. And the sport changes all the damn time and the divisions change all the damn time. And I, I mean, I long for the days of the, Fedor's on a card, everybody worship. And, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, those were fun days. But in truth, we're so much better off than we are now. And everybody can say, oh, it's diluted, this card. Oh, they don't have enough stars on this card. This is boring. Great. Then don't fucking watch. But you're going to see good fights because you're going to see people working behind the, the scenes to produce and connect good fighters. And, I, you know, I would say at least as somebody who, you know, who's been watching Invicta since it first started, that, it's you guys have done a remarkable job of creating shows that feel like big shows, even with names that people don't know. Where it's like, yeah. even though you might have a handful of people who are, you know, zero and zero making their pro debut every card, those still feel like fights that I end up wanting to care about and wanting to watch because I trust that they're well matched and that they're well booked and that you guys wouldn't be getting these people if you didn't think that they could fight. No, um, you don't put somebody in there because you think it's going to be good for another person. You put two people in there that are going to fight. That's so I got to ask too then, and I, you know, how much of it, how much of a jumble and how much of a different puzzle is it when you are matching people who are zero and zero or one and zero oh or zero oh and one and trying to like, do you pick out, um, do you pick out fighters that you're like, I want, I, we need this person to succeed. I want to give them the right matchups to succeed. Or is it something that you find end up having to go through for everyone? I realize that's a really kind of a loaded question. But. It is. And I, I have to be completely honest with you. I can't answer it. Um, yeah. But I can tell you that Caitlin Young's doing an extremely good job. <laughs> that's fine. No, yeah. I, I, I get it. It's a, it's a very loaded question. Cause it's, it's one of those things all about, you know, theory for me. If I look at like the difference between the Joe Silva method, method, which is basically similar tenure, winners against win winners, losers against losers. That's what you see is, you know, are two guys three and two? Okay, they're going to fight each other if they're both coming off a win. And mm -hmm. um, then I look at something like Scott Coker method, which seems to be we have established this person is going to be a star for us. And if they fall, you know, and if they lose a couple of fights, we're going to give them a fallback where it's like, okay, they're going to fight this guy. This guy's good, but not somebody we're invested in, somebody they should beat. If they beat them, then we'll put them in another big headlining fight. And that's, it's just this constant sort of bounce back and forth. And to Coker's credit, Strike Force created a ton of really bright stars that way. And to the UFC's credit, they create really deep divisions that way. It's yeah, just, they're very different methods. We've never had a fighter die because of medical related reasons. Yeah, well, because th that what you're seeing now, and well, and what you're seeing, I understand what you're saying. You're seeing fighters who are O and O, and you're thinking, uh, well, you know, how do you match that up? How do you get that? They're professional fighters, even when it's their pro debut. They're professional fighters. They come from a background of combat sports. They come from scouting. They come from seeing. There's amazing inner. Um, to the amateur shows out there mm -hmm. who like, you know, like tough enough and stuff like that. Women are getting fights now that are not known about because it's on an amateur level, but there's some really, really good talent out there. 
and they're growing. And it, it's kind of a sucky thing to say, get an amateur fight, go get, you know, in the cage, go to go get in the ring right now and you're not going to get paid for it, but it's going to build your career up. But honestly, it's like an internship. You yeah. figure out if you want that job or not, you, you become an intern. And if you understand that you could get really messed up, but you're putting your time in and you love what you're doing. Don't fight if you don't love what you're doing. God, I, I, I hate that. But yeah, if, if you really, and I really think there's very few women in the sport who fight and don't love it. Very few. Because we have been in it long enough to understand that the pay is different. Or it was back in my day anyway. Like things are, are, are better now. But the potential for stardom is, is it's just different with women and men. And the potential for big paychecks also different with women and men. And a lot of the women who are doing it aren't getting paid very much. They're going to amateur shows, paying for all their, uh, their medicals and stuff themselves and fighting and deciding whether or not that's what they want to do. And I do think of it a little bit as an internship. They're building up their resumes. They're understanding if this is something they want to take professionally as a career and they want to live through all the pitfalls and, and problems that happen. But, Amateur fighters making pro debuts on Invicta cards are not people who don't want to fight. Oh, of course. People they pick out of the crowd and, oh, okay, let's get into the – yeah, it's, it's never that way. They're athletes. Oh, oh of course, of course. I, I wasn't even trying to – I'm being all defensive because you started talking about Scott Coker and I just wanted to have a heart attack. No, oh no, God, that was not that. Was, please take that out. I didn't mean heart attack in reference to that. Just like it just – he gets my blood pressure up sometimes – because, oh, God, I, I just, that was terrible. I apologize. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize. It's, no, because I, was, I wasn't even trying to make a joke. That no, just, no, no, just, no, 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 no. I, it's, not, it, it's nothing anybody uh, that I certainly would take as a joke. Anyway, just, yeah. it, it's not, you know, it, it's one of those things, like I say, I, I'm trying to find perspective of how, because, like, I, I see styles out there of how these mm -hmm. things are built and how people, how promoters pr focus on the sport and how they build it. And especially is like, you know, as you talk about having worked with Joe Sylvan a lot. I, I mean, I do feel like Invicta is very much on that method of these, assembly, you know, th these people are zero and zero. We're going to match them up. These people both won their last fight. We're going to match them up. These people both lost their last fight. We're going to match them up and we're going to push the people that succeed rather than, figuring out who, who, who we think is going to succeed first and then pushing them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you want to definitely, you want to believe in every single fighter on the card. And again, this is really a conversation to have with Caitlin at this point, but yeah. um, you want everyone to succeed that fights for the organization. And one of my problems is that I just fell absolutely in every, with in love with every fighter I came across. Like I was like, Oh, you're just such a great person. Oh, you're such a great fighter. You know, it's just like, and it's devastating to watch them lose, but you do know that the ones who win, you have limited space on a card. You just do. And, and you have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for the success of the company as well. well so, and that's the competitive side of a sport. Sports is about winning and losing at the, at the end of the day. I mean, there's unfortunately no other way to cut it for a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, you wouldn't be in it if you didn't love it. And that includes all the people <laughs> who aren't even fighting. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I mean, I can't imagine, like, I hope, and I know there are fighters who don't love it, but I hope there aren't many because MMA is not a sport made for, like, it's not a, a sport made for making money. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a, it's a sport you get into and you test yourself as a human being, but it's a little bit like, I guess, military service, not in the sense that fighters give as I'm, as much to the military. Yeah, I'm not saying that we're not like fighters are, yeah. Two different things, but I'm saying yep. when, you, when you enlist, you understand you're in it for a certain time period or you're going to be in it for life, right? And you generally don't sign on to be in the military for life unless you know it's what you want to do. It's what you're meant to do. It's what you have that you belong to. And I think, I think fighting is, I think, I do think people need to get out of fighting when they lose their love uh, of it. Um, and it's, I, I can't ever tell people like at what point to do that i did it at the right time i could have done it earlier but you know um it, it's definitely something that uh, even as like a writer i my my evolve the evolving perspective i ended up having to get was 
never tell somebody to retire. Yeah. It's, it's never like, I'm never going to be a guy on the sideline being like this dude should retire. I'll be like, mm-hmm. I don't want to see this person fight anymore because I don't believe, I don't believe in what they're doing as entertainment anymore. Mm-hmm. But if they want to keep fighting, like, I don't know what's going on in somebody else's life. If fighting is the best thing they have, who am I to tell them that it's what they need to stop doing? Well, I, you know, on a personal note, days like today, weeks like this week, which were incredibly hard, um, I couldn't think of anything I would want to cope with more than to get back in the cage. Like, that's that's home. And I know it's not for me anymore, but, you know, from this morning hearing things, all I could think of is how much I wanted to punch somebody in the face. Like, that was a fun <laughs> You know, it's just like, this is, I don't know how to cope with this. I, I need to hit somebody. Um, I need to be in there. I need to be pushing my body. So my brain is thinking differently. It's working in a different direction. And I don't have to cope with the insanity of what's happening. So. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, I think it's something that, and we see it across all combat sports that it's not, you know, it, it is, it becomes a home for a lot of these athletes where it's, it is what they do. It's it's not. I mean, it's not just a job, but it's what represents them. Yeah. You know, but it's an identity. It's you never want to stop being a fighter. You maybe want to stop fighting, but you never want to stop being a fighter. And that's it's something that should be respected about fighters, even though we mourn it a little bit and we mock it. You know, as a society, it's as the MMA culture. There's so many beautiful things about MMA culture, and there's so many dismissive things that forget the human elements of it and i don't know you never want to stop being a fighter you just maybe want to stop fighting how how much do you think do you feel like your perspective has changed on mma as like a sport over you know even since you retired even over the past few years i understand the media a lot more now uh they were the enemy when i was fighting i hated all you guys because yeah, that's fire. Yeah, I mean, it was like, and I tried to be nice, and I definitely had people I was friendly with. I had some people I was very friendly with. You know, they were good friends, but I was just like, you read somebody doing play-by-play of one of your fights on the internet saying, oh, look how many times she missed in a row. Oh, she's got nothing. You know, you're just like, do you fucking know how much I put into this? Do you know that that's my heart out there you're stomping on? But, you know, and now that I'm behind the microphone... I also can see where I have to, I don't want to be brutal to people, but I have to be honest. And, and I have to be honest from the perspective that I have. And so when I see fighters fighting, you know, I hope that I honor the fact that they've put so much out there, but I also can't dishonor the people watching and trying to figure out what's going on by not giving them the real story or from my, my interpretation, you know, like what I see. So it's a, it's a hard split. I mean, it, it's it's definitely one of those things. Like I say, you know, from my own perspective, for a long time, I've been very much like, I don't need to be the guy that's embedded in somebody's camp. That's you know, spending six weeks watching them train and hearing about them and like getting their whole life story. Because then, if I'm sitting there trying to break down a fight on fight night, I'm not going to be very good at it. Like, I'm I'm just going to be rooting for them. Yeah, you're going to come from a biased a, a biased place. Whether or not you enjoyed spending time with them or not, yet something's going to come out of it. But that's a that's I don't want to say that's sad, but to, there's people worth getting to know. Oh, of course, of course. I, I mean, like you know, I'm not sitting here like, well, th- this is why I'm here because there are people worth getting to know. So you know, I, I I'm I'm I, t- I, I want to create more of those be- those lines and try to find people like yourself who have been on both sides because it's easier to come across to to make that connection and be like you know to explain both ends of it when you're not talking to somebody who is just in the gym all the time and saying look the, the things you say about me you're you're a prick and yeah you're, you know you're making my life harder yeah yeah you're making me not look attractive to sponsors and you don't realize that because but here's the thing you also have to MMA reporting, MMA like blogging and journalism and all of that. It plays such an important role because you can't be a commercial for somebody. Yeah. You can't be dishonest about what you see and what you say. You know, even if you have to eat shit for it, because 
what the reason that so many people embed themselves in camps or, or they're they're trying to be so close to all those fighters um, is because they understand that what really connects people is human interest stories. Yeah. Understanding who the human is, who the fighter is, but that connects the normal average person watching MMA to the fighter. So I think that MMA reporters, not the ones who just, I don't know, dick around on Twitter and give scoops. Um, but I've never I, scooped a thing in my life, so. <laughs> no, I never either. I, well, see, I don't even understand. I'd like, I swear to God, I'm not even talking about MMA. I'm just thinking about the outing of Elena Ferrante and how fucking pissed I am about that because she's such an amazing author and now maybe we'll never see any of her work again because some guy wanted a scoop. But anyway, that's totally tangential. Um, but yeah, that was a Twitter thing, not even an MMA thing. Anyway, no, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess uh, what I... <sighs> journalism, it plays such an important role in connecting the fans to the fighters and connecting or bringing new fans to fighting. Yeah. And it also, you have to, you have to face some real honesty about yourself as a fighter. If you can look at all that criticism and discern who was actually talking about the fight and who was talking about what they thought they should see because they love pro wrestling. I don't know. I just, I think actually MMA journalism is incredibly difficult. I think that the people involved in it, writing about it, you know, like, I'm in college to learn how to write now. Like, and I, writing about anything is difficult. Writing about something that involves something, it involves a person's entire passion in life. It can break up their family. It can form their family. It can break their hearts. And it, every fighter has their heart broken at least once during camp, like for a failure to do a technique. Or they've had a perfect camp and their heart's broken when they wake up in the middle of the cage and realize, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's difficult mm -hmm. to fight or you are in the bad end of a decision that you knew went your way. Like it's, I don't know. To be able to translate that to the masses, it's hard shit. You guys do hard work. Well, yeah, I, I do much less of it than other people. I'm, I'm much more on the, the end of trying to discern technically. Like, like I say, I, I'm, I'm very much a big picture person. person. I want to figure out how the sport works, where it goes, how it functions, who, you know, it, it, in, if I'm looking at a hundred fighters, who succeeds and why? That kind of thing. And it's, I don't know. It, it's a very, the, the storytelling aspect of it is very, it, it's much harder work. It's much harder emotional work, very, very frankly. I think the stats are hard too, though. I think looking yeah. to see what makes, some, what makes somebody succeed, I think it's hard. I think that you have to know what to look for and then you have to make that look interesting to people who would not find it interesting. That's 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 translation work right there. That's tough. So one of the one of the things I wanted to talk about, just one of this is one of the last things I want to talk about because I've taken a lot of your time already, is um what do you, like one of the things with one of the, the overarching things I'm seeing is that as women's MMA has opened up more weight classes, as it's no longer, you know, 135, 140, and we're starting to see, especially, you know, in the UFC, we get the straw weight division that is consistently putting on top tier fights. And Invicta, you guys have everything, you know, from 155 on down. Um, is it really feels to me like the lighter weight classes in women's MMA are starting to redefine the sport as a woman's sport, if that makes sense? Because I, I I feel like and in some of the larger in some of the you know upper weight classes of women's MMA it sort of ends up as a mirror of men's MMA like we hear a lot of the same kind we see a lot of the same meta game of like this is how you need to wrestle this is how you need to kickbox this is how you need to grapple and as you get lighter you start to get more like I you know it comes up a lot of Invicta is like you see a lot of head and arm throws that work like as a functional technique because people are light enough to really whip each other around. You see a lot of people who are really flexible and suddenly guard grappling is way more effective at lighter weight classes than it is when you're looking at like the men's MMA metagame guard grappling is kind of dying because it just loses you rounds. And we see in part less focus, you know, maybe a less need for focus on things like uh, striking defense because people aren't hitting as hard. And these things correlate into just a different sport that looks 
like women's MMA as at strawweight, it just looks like a different type of MMA to me. Hmm. That's interesting. I, you know, when I watch them, honestly, when I watch them fight, it, it looks like MMA to me, but I, I know what you mean. I, I know the trend of the head and arm throws. It scares me every time. I'm like, your back's going to get taken, kid. But yeah. generally it doesn't. Yeah. Like, there's, and I, I think um, the defensive striking, though, you are looking at people, yeah, the punches might not be as as hard, but they are hitting a target that is not as hard to knock out as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wonder, I, I'd love to see a study on the relativity of, of smaller weight classes or just bring back, it was a Hisai Watanabe, that chick that just knocked everybody out constantly. She was amazing. Um, um, I don't know, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that it's a different sport if it's an evolved sport, but that's, I'm going to keep that in my head. Yeah, because like one of the things I think about is you look at, you know, what, you, if you're looking at men's and women's sports, the, you know, the big ones are like tennis and golf for women where they really uh and more and more so soccer where they really find a field that is get that gets fans just as invested that gets fans mm -hmm. just as excited and a big part of that seems to me to be the openness for rule like the openness for how to play mm -hmm. if you took if you look at sports like a sport like basketball has been basically built around men it says the the rims are going to be this high because that's how high men jump. The ball is going to be this size because that makes sense for the size of the people's hands. The court's going to be this large because that's, you know, relative to the size of the people on it. And when you then put women on that court, it doesn't always translate as well. It doesn't translate to something that is, it doesn't look, it looks like the sport isn't being played quite right at times i mean especially like baseball too it just and i'm not saying that it isn't i'm just saying that that's the look of it whereas when you look at mma you have this very open rule set where it's basically like okay don't commit these five fouls well you can commit half of them as much as you want but whatever you know here here are the the five basic rules of mma here's an open space now do it however the hell you want and it lets people be find a way to make the sport look right for them you know there's something to that, but it could also be that in seeing the entire sport evolves and go through, goes through stages. Like there was a time, sorry, Bailey. Um, she just made a squeaky noise. Um, sorry. She's got her toy. Um, there was a time when, um, uh, people wanted to take their opponent and pin them to the cage to fight them. Now you take your opponent to the cage, you know, they're going to get up. So there's, there's elements in, you know, you wanted to get mount because that's where the best submissions were from. Well, now you never want to roll off mount for a submission because you know you can commit more damage there. So I I would say that we may not, it may not necessarily be the women, but it may be that they're being trained in the full skill sets. The women you're seeing come up now, like the heavier weight class women at this point, they're either very, very beginner or they're people who've been around for a long time but haven't had the opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, trying to incorporate that, you're going to see, I think, as a whole, a lot of different things happening in the sport. And I do think that in a way, the Invicta Cage is a really nice um, laboratory for that, to totally quote mm -hmm. Brad Jackson. Um, but in watching that, you will see evolved technique because you're seeing people who are a little bit younger, who have been trained a lot, or not even a little bit younger, but maybe I'm, I'm saying, I guess they haven't had as much experience in the uh -huh. sport. So they're actually being trained the right way to begin with. And they don't have maybe those old habits from another generation of fighters that they had, that new coaching has learned to work around or new technique. Like it used to be, if you threw a Taekwondo kick in a fight, you got laughed at, you know, cause the Muay Thai yeah. person would just come and blast your legs out. Now you throw, I mean, now everybody's trying to throw spinning kicks and Taekwondo because they're starting to understand uh, snappy kicks have a place too. a snap kick to the head. Amazing. A snap kick to the leg can be devastating, you know? Um, and if you throw a tie kick midsection, granted, if it's done right, it'll just break the ribs. But if you throw it midsection, there's a good chance it's going to be caught. So I think that as the sport evolves, you're going to see new testing grounds. And I don't know if it's necessarily gender or weight class specific as it is uh, the sample size you're looking at. Yeah, that maybe? could be. I mean, because I know in men's MMA too, like I, I consider 
everything above 185 to be almost a fundamentally different, or like 185 and above to almost be fundamentally different between than 170 and below, just because of like what the people are capable of. Like if you, you know, the extremes of that being you take a heavyweight fight and you, a flyweight fight and you put them right next to each other and the technical level at which the flyweights are able to operate is just way different than where the heavyweights can operate and need to. Yeah, but I would argue like Josh Barnett's ground game right there or something to that effect yeah. where there's heavyweights who are operating on a on an extremely skilled level. You're just not maybe used to seeing that much mass working in that way. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like I'm not saying they're not skilled. It's just like the metagame allows for this works here for me, you know, and this doesn't like one of the things you see at flyweight is that there are almost no, there's almost no control wrestling at flyweight mm -hmm. because it's impossible to hold these people down. Like even a very good wrestler, they can get someone to the ground and that person just going to scramble out from under them. So if you try to hold someone down at flyweight, you're going to end up with them back on their feet, no matter what. And so it's just one of those things like you don't see it. And I, I honestly have never considered it in, in that trend. Whenever I'm watching a fight, I always just think the, the individual skill sets that are going on or what's been trained mm -hmm. and not necessarily associated with this. I mean, I guess it, I do find it preferable to watch one over another a lot of the time, but it's usually, I just want, um, I just like heavyweights at, um, Altitude, high altitude, just. <laughs> that's, I love that is MMA and, 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 and I have a different reason for it. I, I love when people gas in a fight because I know exactly what that's like. And somehow they physically encompass exactly how you feel. Like they just, it's like, I don't know. I love that. The heavyweight at high altitude is my favorite. Whatever. Round three of a heavyweight fight does have its own specific majesty. Yes. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think actually, I, I honestly think you're onto something there with the lighter weight classes being able to to perform at a different level or, or bring it just a different MMA game to the table. Because, you know, it's, and I'm an analyst, I should be thinking about this kind of shit, but I just generally think about the fighters in front of me and how I, how they're, you know, doing and what I know that they're capable of. That's interesting. I'm going to, the metadata and stuff like that, that's, that's cool. So uh, on that note, I want to wrap things up. Um, I don't know if there's any other last points you wanted to cover, but I feel like I've kind of covered everything that I had in mind. Yeah. No, I did. I don't know how many people are watching this, and I don't want to start crying again, but I do want to just kind of give a shout out to Josh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those who don't know, uh, Josh's a man who, you know, obviously – somebody who's, who Julie is very close to and is somebody that I've worked to, with on several occasions and is, in fact, the last guest I had on this show. I spent an hour talking with him. Harder. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, you know, he recently passed away. And so it's been a really kind of trying <laughs> week for all of us, especially at Bloody Elbow, where he did a lot of work and, you know, for those in the fight community that knew him. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I didn't mean to was... call attention to that or anything. I just, I do feel yeah. like you know, to his friends and his family, hang in there, you know. Yeah. So uh, on that note, which is you know, unfortunately, it's a very somber note, but it it is, it's <laughs> it's the way life is. Um, you can find me on Twitter, the Zane Simon. You can find Julie on Twitter at Jules K underscore fighter. You can find me over at bloodyelbow.com and you can find Julie on Invicta at Invicta and doing Invicta broadcasts and all that good stuff. Um, if you watch the show, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. That helps us a lot. Subscribe to MMANation.com. That's our YouTube channel. And thanks for everyone. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and I'll see you all next time. I'm